for the last uh, few weeks, we've been talking about the cost of discipleship and the uh, high price that comes with following Jesus. And this uh, pushed me back to our days in the Middle East. And uh, we lived in the Middle East for about a decade and worked there um, and was in a Christian ministry. Uh, and uh, we would have Muslims that would call the church office or come to visit me and uh, interested in following Jesus. And uh, you never knew exactly what the motivation was behind the visit, uh, but I would always keep a stack uh, of this uh, paper right here uh, to give to them on their way out. Uh, and it's Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10. And he says stuff like, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. They're going to deliver you over. They're going to drag you in front of governors. Uh, your, your brother will hand you over to death. You're going to be persecuted. Um, they're going to malign you. Uh, don't think that I came to bring, bring peace uh, I came to set a man against his father. Uh, a person's enemies are going to be those of their own household. Whoever uh, won't lose, the, loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I wanted them to understand uh, the high cost of discipleship. Uh, and uh, in that culture, this, this, is no, this was no joke. That's exactly uh, the cost that they would be paying uh, to follow Jesus. And, and the cost of discipleship is definitely a discussion that needs to happen uh, with someone considering following Jesus. There is this suffering, there is this denying of yourself, uh, there is this sacrifice that is required and demanded as a cost of discipleship. Uh, but once someone is willing to embrace that cost of discipleship, uh, the good news is uh, that it, the story doesn't end there. Actually, there is a great cost of discipleship, but Jesus isn't shy in talking about also the great rewards of discipleship. Um, all, there is a high price to pay, but there's amazing rewards to be received. And Jesus wasn't, uh, he wasn't shy about talking to his disciples about actually the rewards of discipleship. And it was just after one of Jesus's uh, tough talks on the cost of discipleship that his, his uh, followers asked him, hey, okay, we, we've done this, we're in, we're willing to pay the cost, we've left everything to follow you, uh, well, what's in it for us? Uh, what are the rewards of discipleship here, Jesus? And Jesus answered them, and Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Uh, Jesus says the, the cost that you're going to give up uh, actually, the rewards are going to outweigh it. And uh, we all know about storing up treasures in heaven and rewards in heaven, but Jesus says uh, in the age to come, there will be rewards, right, eternal life. But what, also, what else does he say up there? Yeah, not just in the age to come, but now. Uh, there are rewards of discipleship right now. There's rewards for following Jesus in this life. Um, as we invite people to follow Jesus, we're not saying life's going to stink, but you get to go to heaven. That, that's not the message. Uh, the message is, yes, there's a price to pay, but following Jesus has great rewards. There's a great life to be lived as a follower walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Now, if we went around the room and we asked, okay, what are the earthly perks of following Jesus, uh, we could probably get a hundred right answers because there's many, many great things about following Jesus. I, I was just thinking through a few. Uh, one perk of following Jesus now, an earthly reward, is that we don't have to worry and live in fear and anxiety about what's going to happen tomorrow. We can actually live uh, in peace today, knowing that God's in control 
and not just some far off God is in control, but the God who loves us is in control. God is control and God is on our side. That's an amazing perk for life right now as a disciple. We get to live in this world, uh, not just with peace, but in, with purpose as we go throughout our life. We're not just aimlessly here wondering, why am I here? What is life about? We understand that life is about the glory of God, bring, bringing people's attention to the greatness of King Jesus Christ so they can bow the knee to him now and spend eternity with him. We have a purpose here of glorifying God, showing people how great he is, and inviting them to follow him. This is the perk of discipleship right now. And one perk of discipleship you're experiencing as you sit in this room together and we worship God together, and if you look to your left and you look to your right, you see an amazing perk, the perk of partnership. Having brothers and sisters in this world, a true spiritual family in this world that shares uh, our same hope, shares our same commitments, shares our same values, and we know we can walk and trust, with, uh, walk with each other and trust each other throughout this life. The, the, uh, the partnerships that we have with other believers are an amazing perk uh, of discipleship right now. Now, the perk of discipleship that I want to talk about this morning is the perk of access. The reward that we get for following Jesus of direct access anytime to talk to the God of the universe. We have a direct line to God. This is an amazing right now perk of following Jesus Christ. This is an amazing reward of discipleship. Uh, most of the world does not know God's number, but God has given us his personal cell phone number, and what we call this as Christians is prayer. We can get a hold of God, we have access to God the Father any time we want. Day or night, for any reason, God the Father welcomes us uh, to get a hold of him and share our needs with him, share our heart with him. This is an amazing benefit and reward um, of our discipleship. Now, the most famous teaching on prayer in the Bible, I would say, is Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 6 called the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to be spending some time in the Lord's Prayer this morning in Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, uh, please open up to Matthew chapter 6. And Mark, I promise at some point we're going to get to Matthew chapter 6. But before we look at Jesus' instructions on how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, I want to answer a first question, and the question is, why should I talk to God? Uh, sometimes it feels like uh, talking to God, the only thing accomplished is our food is getting cold, right? Why should we take the time uh, to talk to God? Why is this such a benefit? Why is this such a perk of discipleship? And uh, the answer is found in thinking of prayer, not as just some religious thing we do uh, that we have to sit, uh, you can't eat before you, pr uh, before you prayed, um, uh, or some religious thing we do in church, some religious exercise, uh, but prayer is actually engaging in a very important relationship that we've been given. Uh, prayer isn't about being religious and doing just one more religious thing. It's actually about taking advantage of and enjoying the, the, the relationship that Jesus has created for us with God the Father. And this might be a surprise, and it, it, uh, as people that have been Christians a long time, and if you're a kid and you've grown up as a Christian, you might not have thought of this, but most of the world cannot talk to God the way that you talk to God as a Christian. Um, you have God's direct line. Most people in the world, their call is blocked. Uh, God is not listening to them as a loving father accepting them. There's something that's keeping uh, them from having access to God, uh, and that's their sin. You and I would not have access to God as our Father to just go to him whenever we want and be accepted by him and, and heard by him and him answer our prayers unless Jesus had earned that for us. 
uh, unless Jesus had fixed our messed up relationship with God by taking the punishment for our sins on the cross. And in Ephesians chapter two, Paul explains that this is why we have this access to the Father that we get to enjoy in prayer. He says that Jesus reconciled us to God in one body through the cross. He fixed our relationship with God by dying on the cross. And through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Jesus' death is what brought us, gave us this access to God that we get to enjoy. He says, so then, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens with the saints, and we are members of God's family. Now, this access that we have to God, the ability that we have to to go to God the Father as his children and talk to him, this is something that Jesus paid a high, high price to get. Now, before we became Christians, we were strangers to God, and God doesn't answer strangers' calls. And if you think in the world, 90% of the people, they have not been reconciled to the Father by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, they're still strangers uh, fr- with God. Uh, they, they don't have this access that we have. They don't have this privilege that we have of coming to God as our Father and talking to him uh, in prayer. So th- this, uh, this relationship that we have and this access that we have uh, is very special. It's actually very rare. Uh, and to be able to come to God as our caring Father is something amazing that was only brought to us by Jesus. For us to be able to say, like in the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, our Father who is in heaven, uh, that required the death of his Son. Um, the, this access that we have to God is very very special, very precious. We've been moved by Jesus Christ from hostility with God to acceptance by God. We've been moved from separation from God to now having family access to God. And and this is why Jesus says, come on, take advantage of what I've got for you. Uh, I've created this opportunity for you now to interact with my father as your father. Uh, Ask him. Uh, Seek him, knock. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And then he says, God wants you to come, and God wants to give you good things. He says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus says, come, take advantage uh, of this precious perk that I have earned for you, uh, the ability to come to God in prayer and, and ask him for our needs. So th- this is the first answer to Gregory's question of why should I pray in the first place. And uh, the first reason is to talk to God because he is your caring father. Not everybody on, in the planet can say this. But we can say this because of Jesus Christ, that we can pray to God because he is our loving father. Inside your bulletin, there is an outline, and you'll notice the uh, sermon is titled, How to Talk to Your Dad. And the number one, uh, this first blank, uh, is caring. Talk to God because he is your caring father. The simple fact that Jesus identifies the God of the universe as our father, not just his father, that makes a lot of sense to me, but our father emphasizes uh, the intimacy and closeness of the relationship that Jesus has earned for us uh, with God the Father. And in the Lord's Prayer, something that we notice as we look at the Lord's Prayer itself in Matthew 6, and then the Jesus' surrounding teaching about prayer is over and over and over. Uh, he's saying, your Father, your Heavenly Father, our Father, your Father. He's bringing us in, wanting us to understand that God cares deeply for us, and he cares deeply for us as his children. Now, Jesus says here, Uh, that our Father in heaven is actually excited to give us good things in response to our prayers. And and this is uh, very good news, and I want to offer this as the second reason to pray. Uh, It's because uh, our Father is a generous Father. 
This is a, this is a great reason to pray, not just because he cares and he's listening, if that weren't enough, but he actually responds and he likes to respond to us with generosity. He likes to give us the good things that we ask for. Isn't that amazing? That, that simply because we ask, uh, he's excited to give us good things. Now, I'm saying you should pray because you can get good things. And you should pray because God will reward you. And, it, it, and that, that uh, s- might seem a little bit uh, crass to say pray so God rewards you. Uh, but consider this, that when Jesus is speaking to uh, the Sermon on the Mount, where we find the Lord's Prayer, this whole section is about practicing righteousness to get rewards from God. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, he, this whole section, he talks about giving, he talks about fasting, he talks about praying, and why, why does he say to do these things in a godly way? So that you will get reward, he says it. Uh, he, he says, give in secret, uh, and your father who is in secret will reward you. Pray in secret, and your father who, who sees in secret will reward you. Fast in secret, the same thing. The, the father will reward you, and then he goes into that section on laying up treasures in heaven. Uh, so praying to the father actually brings us rewards from the father. Because the Father is generous and he's happy to give us uh, these good things. And in, in, this, in the middle of this discussion about rewards, uh, right in the middle lands the Lord's Prayer. So the Lord's Prayer, uh, how to pray, uh, is surrounded by this whole discussion of storing up treasures in heaven by practicing authentic righteousness uh, for the pleasure of God alone and then receiving rewards from God as a result. Now, even just in this, uh, this section, uh, the rewards are many. The rewards for prayer are many. I want you to pray, and I want you to pray to get good things. W- one of them uh, is these treasures in heaven later, and I would say that these are honors in heaven, but that's something coming in the future. The rest of them are rewards for praying that God gives us now. Uh, implied here and a little bit later are the answers to our requests, right? Those are rewards for praying, good things that God gives us uh, for praying. Uh, in the Lord's Prayer itself, you remember, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, uh, these, these are rewards as well that we receive uh, for praying God's provision, whether it's physical provision for today or spiritual provision for today, uh, God's protection, uh, God's forgiveness. These are all rewards that God gives us for praying. Uh, and then uh, Jesus talks a little bit later in the chapter about not worrying because your Father in heaven knows exactly what you need already, and he connects these reward, this prayer with uh, freedom fr- from anxiety and uh, experiencing joy in this life. So additional rewards for right now for praying are peace and joy. So I want you to pray I want you to pray to get rewards. And uh, does this stuff look good? Is is any of this appealing to you? Yeah, I I want all this stuff today. And if you are like me and you want these rewards, uh, you know God's number. Uh, He is available, uh, he is listening, and he invites us to come and pray to him because he cares for us and because he is very generous. So why should we talk to our dad? What's the point? The point, is, the reason is our dad cares and our dad is very generous with his children. Now, the uh, second question, now that hopefully we want to talk to dad, is how should we talk to dad? And this is what Jesus gives us a lot of help with in Matthew chapter 6. How exactly uh, should we talk to dad? And the first, first uh, way to talk to dad that Jesus gives us is to talk to dad privately. And on your uh, outline, uh, this is the third blank, to talk to dad privately. 
the front of the page was uh, your father cares and your father uh, is generous, your generous father. Back of the page, number three, to talk to dad privately. And we get this from Jesus' lead up to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter six. So if you have it open now, uh, read with me in verses five and six. He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. So before Jesus tells us how we should pray, He gives us a, a, here's how you should not pray. And he says, do not pray like the hypocrites. And the hypocrites pray to receive attention from people. They pray for the applause of others. They pray to look religious. They pray to look spiritual. They pray actually not for God's pleasure, uh, but to please and impress other people. Uh, actually, a, a couple of verses earlier, he says these same hypocrites, uh, not just that they want to be seen by others, but that they may, may be praised by others. Uh, they, they fake like they're praising God so that they can get praised by other people. And he call, calls them hypocrites. He says, don't be a hypocrite that acts spiritual for the attention of others. And they're hypocrites because, one, They're claiming uh, that they are uh, trying to talk to God. They're interacting with God. Uh, But in actuality, they're just performing for the other people. It's almost uh, like uh, they're in a play, uh, in a movie, uh, on set, and just using God as a prop uh, to impress other people uh, and uh, get uh, the applause Uh, of other people. Uh, He he says, do not be a hypocrite. And it's not just that uh, uh, you're seen praying by other people. Uh, It's the motivation that you're doing it to be seen by other people, to impress other people. Uh, Ben and Jasmine came to pick up the boys uh, or their kids last night, and the boys were out playing video games in the garage. And uh, somebody said, your parents are here. So, so I told the boys, hey, go in the living room. We're telling you you're having a prayer meeting. So they went in, and they were, they were all sitting on the uh, couch. And I'm not sure if I accidentally made them hypocrites, but uh, uh, the, I- if that were a true situation, that it would have been very hypocritical if we never would have revealed the joke. Uh, but uh, the, the, the point was we're not, we don't pray to perform and get applause from other people. It's, we're not trying to get applause from our spiritual leaders. We're not trying to get applause from our parents. Uh, we pray because we want a relationship with God. And we value that relationship with God. And he says, you must not be like the hypocrites who pray just to impress people. He says, instead, pray privately out of your desire to be with your father. And and it makes complete sense what he says if prayer is engaging in that relationship that Jesus had created for us, not just some religious activity. What Jesus says about prayer next on how to pray and praying privately makes complete sense. He says this, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father and your father who sees in secret will reward you. He says, forget all the other people. It's, it's not a performance. It's not a religious activity. Uh, we're uh, in, in a relationship with the Father, and we want to build our relationship with the Father, so just go and be with the Father. He says, go away from everybody. Hide, in, hide inside your room. Pray to the Father in secret, but guess what? Uh, he's there. He hears you. He knows And because of the true heart of prayer that you have, just wanting to be with him, uh, he's going to give you the rewards that you desire. This is a question for me, and this is a question for you. Ask yourself, do I talk to God by myself or only when other people are listening? And this, this is a 
This is a, an important question. Um, and and it, it says a lot about um, my, uh, the, the true heart behind my praying. Do I talk to God when I, it's just me and him? Or is it more like a, a religious thing that I uh, do just with other people? Um, and if you only talk to God when other people are around, maybe it's possible that you're not talking to God at all. At all. Maybe you're just talking to them or talking, uh, giving a speech in front of them. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's not that it, it's uh, a sin to uh, pray with other people uh, or pray when other people are listening, um, but no one should ever pray in front of other people unless they also are actively praying by themselves uh, just uh, when it's God. Actually, you can be a fake Christian really easily. You can do a lot of things, uh, a lot of spiritual activity, and not have a relationship with God, right? Uh, I, I could get up here and do the congregational prayer and sound really good and not have a relationship with God. I can fake it, right? Um, you, you could come and lead, lead worship and be an awesome singer and uh, musician and actually not have a relationship with God. I can come up here and I can preach it a amazing sermon, but I could actually not have a relationship with God. So you could find spiritual fakes in any of those places, but one place that I doubt you're gonna find a spiritual fake is in the closet praying by themselves. I don't think you're gonna find a spiritual fake, fake there. Um, uh, the, this, uh, what Jesus' instructions on private prayer, uh, I think he's really getting to the heart of, uh, do we actually have a relationship with God as our Father uh, or not? So th this is what he's encouraging us to. Uh, he's encouraging us uh, to go one-on-one -on -one with the Father. Forget everybody else, else forget the religious activity, um, get to the heart of prayer, and that heart of prayer is personal, and that heart of prayer is is relational. Now, I don't think in this passage Jesus is canceling the prayer meetings. I don't think Jesus is canceling praying with other people. It kind of sounds like it for a minute when he says, hey, no, just go and pray in your room by yourself. Uh, but even in the example that Jesus gives in the next verses of the Lord's Prayer, uh, he presents it as something to be prayed with other people. Right? He doesn't say pray like this, uh, my Father in heaven, give me my daily bread. He presents even the Lord's Prayer in the next verses as something to be prayed with other people, uh, to come together uh, either as a family, as a church, and pray these things uh, together for God's uh, guidance and blessing on us as a group. And we see the disciples um, praying together and God powerfully answering their prayers. So there's definitely a place for praying together, even praying in, other pe in front of other people. Uh, but the heart of a true child of God praying to God is communion with the Father. Uh, so how, how would it be that we can pray privately, but even in a group? And I would suggest that even if we're praying in front of a group, uh, it should feel like to other people that they're eavesdropping on a private conversation between us and our dad. Um, that uh, it is clear that we're not just making a speech, uh, a spiritual speech, uh, but that we're having a, a personal talk with our father. So how do we pray? Jesus' first word is to pray privately, authentically, seeking that relationship with God the Father. And some of us might say, well, I, I really like the whole praying the closet thing because uh, there's no way you're getting me uh, up front in a church service to pray or even to pray in a smaller group setting. I, 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 I uh, would pr prefer to pray in my closet by myself because I don't, I don't know the right words. I uh, can't uh, uh, articulate the great theology that needs to be presented in a public prayer. Uh, and the good news is that Jesus' second piece of advice on how to pray is to pray simply. To talk to our dad privately and talk to our dad simply. It's number four on your outline. This is good news 
uh, for we who have a hard time coming up with the fancy words, right? Uh, Jesus actually wants us to pray simply, and he says it in the verses 7 and 8 of chapter 6. He says, and when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask. Uh, Jesus isn't looking for uh, impressive words, impressive formulas, uh, long prayers, uh, intense theological content, Uh, You shouldn't need a dictionary to be able to understand what I'm praying from up here. Uh, Jesus is not impressed with performance, and he's not impressed with fanciness. Uh, Jesus invites us to pray simply, and this is very good news. Now, I got a, uh, here's a trivia question for you. I tested this out on my kids See how it goes. Uh, What is the best thing to say when you don't know what to pray next? Amen. Yes, that that is correct. That's a point for you up in the front. Uh, You don't have to keep on going. Uh, God is quite content when you're done. Uh, No need to keep going on. Uh, No no need to uh, heap up empty phrases. And I think the, the word behind that is the same word for babbling. Babbling on. You don't need to keep babbling on. Just land the plane. Um, and end it. Here, here's a second trivia question. What is the longest prayer in the Bible? And I'll say the New Testament. We're talking stuff, a uh, prayer prayed out loud. Anybody know? My wife answered it last night at the dinner table. She knew. John chapter 17, and it, coming up, up soon, and it's an entire, it's an entire chapter Uh, as Jesus is walking from the upper room to the garden with his disciples and he's teaching them about uh, God's love for them and then he switches and he prays for them. And do you know, could you guess how long that prayer is as far as time? An hour? Three minutes. (laughs) That's the longest prayer in the New Testament is the three minute prayer. Uh, so that's, that's pretty short, pretty simple. I, and I know with sermons, you're asking why does sermon have to go so long then, Greg? And the sermon goes longer because I'm talking to people, right? And people have uh, new information they need to gain, uh, need to think through things. They don't know everything already. Uh, but God is different. That when we pray, we're not talking to people, right? We're talking to God, and God actually already knows it all. Um, so it's okay to keep it short. And that's what he says. That's why we don't need to go on and on and use all these fancy words. He says uh, that your Father in heaven already knows. Right? He's inviting you to bring these things to him, uh, but you can keep it simple because he already knows all the details. He knows exactly what we, what we need even before we ask him. Uh, And Jesus then gives a simple example of a simple prayer uh, that has a heart uh, of relational connection to God, but then uses simple words, simple structure, simple truths, and simple requests. And that's what we know as the Lord's Prayer. And this is Jesus' example of praying with simplicity. And let's look at it now. And we're a, a few minutes into the sermon, right? And I could go through this and I could uh, spend a week on each of the verses in the Lord's Prayer. But that would be doing the exact opposite of what Jesus was just teaching us about prayer, of keeping it simple. So let, let's read through it and just look at it in its simplicity. Jesus says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is Jesus' example of a simple, heartfelt prayer to God. And you can see just... uh, uh, from a a quick look that the structure is very simple. 
what would you say the structure is? The first half is about God, right? Second half is about us. Uh, very simple. Um, the, the first half being about uh, what the Father deserves. The second half being about uh, what we need. I want to offer this as uh, a, a summary of the first half there, uh, or how to pray. And this is uh, number 4A on your outline. is to talk about what dad simply deserves. Talk about what dad simply deserves. It's about him, Right? You could call it this part worship, adoration. Um, there's lots of different names, but this is just talking to dad about what dad uh, simply deserves. And Jesus teaches us to pray that our father would, res- uh, uh, would uh, get the respect that he deserves and he would be feared as he deserves. Uh, just like in heaven, Uh, God is respected and feared that on earth, uh, in this world, uh, God would get the same respect that he deserves. That he he would get the respect that he deserves for who he is, for being the creator of the universe. Uh, He'd get the respect that he deserves uh, for being the one who sent his son to redeem us, for him being the only savior. That he'd get the respect that he deserves uh, for keeping the world spinning every day, the respect that he deserves for being the one that everyone will have to answer to on that final day when we're, we're judged. Uh, our prayer is that now God would get the respect and the fear uh, that he deserves. He talks about praying that God's kingdom would come. Uh, and this is a simple prayer in the prayer of our heart uh, that God would be honored and God would be served by everybody. Wouldn't that be awesome if God got what he deserves of honor and service, just like uh, those that are in heaven, uh, the saints of the past and the angels of heaven uh, honor and serve him now? Uh, wouldn't that be awesome if that came to earth? if God got that honor and service uh, from everybody else, and and that his will would be done on earth just like it is in heaven, that people would trust him and his wisdom and as a result obey him and follow him completely. This is our our prayer, and we know that right now all of these things are only realities in part, that people in this world um, uh, do not love him and fear him and honor him and trust him uh, as they should. But there's a day coming, uh, and this is what we're praying for as we pray uh, for his kingdom to come and his will to be done, is that day when it's going to happen. Uh, the the uh, respect that God has His kingdom in heaven is going to become his kingdom on earth. This is a day that we look forward to, and we know it's not going to uh, be a complete reality until Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom of honor here on earth. Uh, But this is what we pray for. This is what we wait for. As those who are citizens of heaven, we, we await this day where Jesus is going to set up his kingdom and the Father is going to get everything that he deserves now. But as we pray for it, we pray for it as those who have been changed ourselves. We're no longer part of the world, we're no longer part of this disrespectful, um, disobedient system anymore. We pray for these things as citizens of heaven. And we're, we pray for these things, uh, we, we want these things to be not just a reality on the earth someday in the future, uh, but we pray that these things would be a reality now among us. Uh, that the Father would get the respect that he deserves uh, from, from us, uh, start, starting here, right? Um, that, uh, I, that his kingdom would be, tr- would be real as we serve him as our king, uh, as individuals, as our family, as our church, uh, that in, uh, in Paul's bow in Silverdale, uh, that God would be honored and served uh, in the Grismer family, in OEFC. Uh, this, is, this is our prayer today. While we wait for the kingdom to be established on the earth, we want the kingdom to be a reality among us. 
Uh, we want God's will to be done, not just in the future, we know it's coming, uh, but today, for God to be trusted by me, for God to be trusted by my family, uh, God to be trusted and obeyed by our church. So th this is a prayer for the fu in, the, in the future for God to get what he deserves, uh, but even for now, uh, that God would continue to work in our hearts um, and that we would give him the, the honor that he deserves as we live today. Uh, as we pray to God, uh, we're praying that, that the Father would get exactly what he deserves from us and that would spread uh, to, to everybody else. So the first part, we talk to God about what he simply deserves, and then he invites us uh, to talk to him about what we simply need as well. And this is the second half of the prayer and the final point on the outline, to talk about what dad simply deserves, but then also to talk about what we simply need. And as we've committed ourselves to being servants of his kingdom, to honoring him, to carrying out his will. Then we're asking, okay, as we do this, as we try and walk with you, uh, can you help us out a little bit? Um, yeah, can you give us the things that we need? And you can see there, there's uh, f uh, four simple requests. He says, pray, give us our daily bread, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Very simple, but very necessary things uh, that uh, Jesus teaches us to ask the Father. Uh, the first one is to ask God for our physical provisions and here he gives the example of our daily bread. Um, and I, I, th I think that this uh, category, as Jesus is teaching us uh, how to pray, the category is larger. Um, in, in our family, we uh, pray for and thank God for daily work for dad so we can buy daily bread. Right? Um, and so we're praying to God for our physical provisions. I, I think this could include... Uh, praying for God uh, to, um, uh, to heal somebody in our family, for pray, praying to God for, uh, for health, praying for God for, to God for anything that we need, that he would provide for our basic physical provisions as we seek uh, to serve him in this world. Uh, but we know uh, that there's a lot more that we're gonna need than just our physical provisions. And uh, the next verse uh, uh, invites us to pray to God for spiritual provisions as well. And the, the uh, uh, most important spiritual provision is a right relationship with him, right? Uh, that we pray, God, will you forgive us our sins so we can walk uh, in close fellowship with you? We don't want anything between you and us as we navigate this world. Um, and it, it includes a prayer that not only will we have a right relationship with God as we go into our day, uh, but a prayer that we'll have a right relationship with other people, right? Uh, he, he says, forgive us our debts and do this. Uh, uh, keep our relationship with you clean uh, as, as we also forgive other people. Uh, keep us, and this is a prayer. Uh, God, can you keep us in right relationship with our uh, spouses? Can you keep us in right relationship with our families? Can you keep us in right relationship with our brothers and sisters? Uh, this is simple, but something we desperately need. Now, I know you, th you might be objecting the same way as me uh, to this first part of the prayer that it say, it gives our daily day bread. Our family is car uh, low carb. We do not pray for daily bread, but when, we've, when we pray, sometimes we change it out. Uh, at our house, it's our daily eggs. Um, so we say this in the Lord's Prayer at times, give us this day our daily eggs, and Jesus is teaching us a way to pray. 
not uh, s- magical words or a specific formula. And he's inviting us, um, whatever it is that we need that day, to come to him uh, and ask for. And, and this, is a, this is an amazing way to start the day. This sounds like a morning prayer to me, um, to give us this day our daily bread and to forgive us our debts. Imagine if we could start out the day, every day like this, with a clean slate, um, in our relationship with God, forgiveness, a clean slate in our relationships with other people, and a full plate of food. Doesn't that, doesn't that sound an amazing way to start the day? Clean slate and a full plate. The day is great. The, this, is, this is how Jesus is inviting us to pray. And as we pray these things, we pray these things for ourselves, right? This clean uh, slate and a full plate for us. But then it's also... Uh, open an open door to pray this for other people, right? Because he says, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, so we can uh, include not just praying for our own provisions, but praying for the provisions of our family, praying for the provisions of our church. Uh, so this open, opens up the door of prayer, uh, an invitation from Jesus uh, to be praying for ourselves and praying for each other that God would provide those things that we need, the spiritual provisions as well as the physical provisions that we need along the way. The last verse is a prayer for direction as well as a prayer for um, protection. And this lead us not to temptation. This was kind of one that was a little weird for me. I wonder why why do we have to pray that? It doesn't seem like God, our Father, would want to lead us into temptation. Why would we pray don't lead us into temptation? And I was thinking, uh, uh, don't lead us into temptation to sin. Don't lead us into situations where uh, we, we want to sin against you. And I, I actually don't think God would uh, do that to us. He doesn't play games with us. He, he's not trying to tempt us uh, to sin. And, and this uh, word for temptation, it's, uh, it's uh, translated different ways in different passages. And it's translated as temptations, sometimes. Uh, t- translated as trials. Uh, translated as testings. And these are difficulties in life um, that um, as we're following God, as we're especially starting our day, we're going to follow you today, whatever path Uh, You lead us on. We're willing to take it. Uh, But I'm praying, can it be a path that doesn't include today trials, testings, or temptations? Uh, Is that a a fair uh, prayer to ask? Is can I have a day where there's nothing that's going to rock my world, uh, there's nothing that's going to... uh, uh, shake my faith, and there's nothing that's going to try and draw me away from you? Is, is that an okay prayer to pray in the morning? A God, can, can today be a day where walking with you is straightforward, uh, simple, just a day full of joy? Uh, I think that this is, this is a, the heart of the prayer. Lead us not uh, into temptation. Although we're willing to follow you on every path, and we know that walking through a trial can bring us spiritual growth. Um, we know that if we're tested, you're going to give us the strength to get through. We know that if we run into sinful temptations, you're going to give us a way out. We know it. But today we can pray, make our path one that's a little bit straighter, a little cleaner, and lead us not into temptation. And as we follow you, whether it's on uh, a simple path of following you with joy, uh, or it's a path of trials, testing, or temptation, uh, we know that this side of heaven is going to be filled with pitfalls because the world is full of evil, Uh, The world is full of evil people. The world is full of uh, Satan and demons. Can you please protect us as we walk with you? And this is the the last request, Uh, this simple request for something we really need and this deliverance from evil. Uh, as, As we walk the path following you, will you please protect us from evil people uh, and the work of the devil? Uh, Will you guard us? Uh, Will you be our fortress? Uh, Will you be behind us and in front of us as we seek to follow you the rest of our life? 
I think this is a simple uh, summary of that last half of the prayer. Lord, as we try to follow you today, please help us out along the way. Simply, uh, amen. And I think this is the prayer that God is happy to answer. This is the prayer uh, that if, if this is your heart, God is, w- welcomes you to bring this prayer to him. Uh, and maybe uh, you're thinking today about reviving your time of prayer with God, your ter- personal time of prayer with God. I know I'm thinking about that. I, I want uh, a uh, more serious and a more engaged time of personal prayer with God. And be encouraged. Even if you haven't called him in a long time, uh, dad cares he wants to hear from you, and dad is generous. Maybe you, you want to start uh, with simply praying this Lord's Prayer. Get by yourself, a time with God, slowly thinking through and praying this prayer. I, I did this so many times uh, this last week, and I can, usually can't get past the first few lines uh, because there's so much to pray about um, as we come before God. But a- as you pray, as you start, uh, keep it private, keep it simple, and enjoy the rewards of your discipleship, this amazing, open, welcoming access to the God of the universe. Let's pray.